So what we should really talk about next is how teams use Git, because that's the other function. Git protects your code from other people <laughs> in a way, right? So it's designed to stop, you know, if say there's a company with like 100 developers in it and they're all working on different parts of the code base and that code base is stored in a Git repository, it's got to find a way to make sure that developer number 50 doesn't overwrite the code of developer number 12 when they're working on like the same area. So this involves a mixture of things. This involves Git protecting code when you're trying to do Git pushes and Git commits, but it also involves um, coordination between people. And so one thing, one of the main reasons you will see things like GitHub and GitLabs being used is because those products, those sort of online websites provide you with lots of other features that are sort of added around Git functionality to help you communicate with each other and coordinate. Um, so let's talk about first the Git pushes and Git commits and what would happen in practice. So if you have two developers and they've both been tasked on fixing a bug at the same time, and to fix that bug, they both need to make a change to one particular file. So maybe I'm editing files one, two, and four, and he's editing files three, five, and four, but we're both gonna edit file four at some point. This becomes a, a situation that Git needs to manage for you. So if person one edits those three files, including file four, creates a git commit and pushes them to the server, that's fine, the server will accept it because there hasn't been any updates from anybody else. It's fine with that. The second person will create their git commit and then type in git push, and then the server will say, no, you can't do that because from the last time you downloaded the latest version, someone else has added more content. So your version is out of date, basically. And it will force you to get yours up to date before it will let you push. So this is a really handy feature, it's protecting the code by stopping one person overwriting someone else. So then what you have to do is type git pull if you're that second person. There's actually, you could do a couple of things. You can do git fetch, which downloads uh, metadata about what has changed, and then you can manually and carefully merge things. Or you can just type in git pull and it will pull down the latest version and it will try to automatically merge everything. So for those separate files that you both edited, and even if you're in one file and you edited different bits of the file, Git will say, when you download the latest version, it'll say, great, I can merge your changes with the latest version and just does it for you. But if you both edit the same sort of area and Git isn't sure, it's very good then. It says, well, okay, I can't do that. I'm not smart enough. Uh, as a bit of software, we need a human who is more smart to um, tell me what should have happened here. So what it will do is it will add both of your lines of code into the file with like some metadata above it. You see a bunch of side arrows and then the word head, and then you see the first person's code, and then you see a, like a, a separator in the middle and the second person code, and then some other line arrows facing the other way to show the last the commit you've been making. And it will say, okay, as a, as a human, you tell me which one to keep or if I should keep a bit of both, you know, figure it out intelligently. And so your job then is to delete the metadata lines and delete the lines of code that don't need to be there anymore and do the merge cleverly as a human. So that, that's, it's sometimes a painful process. It involves you communicating maybe with the other human <laughs> to make sure that, you know, why did you do that? Why did I do this? You know, do we need to keep both, that sort of thing. Um, and then once you've merged it, you can then create a new commit and then you can push the server, hoping that no one else has pushed something in the meantime. Um, but it's your job as a developer to make sure that you're going to push something that doesn't break other people and Git helps you do that by saying no. Because I can imagine that if you're two developers working for, say, someone like YouTube and you're both working on the code base for YouTube servers, if you need to sort of subtly adjust that, that could affect nearly everybody working on all the different areas. So, yeah, for sure, in principle, you're right that there's these bits that might get reused by lots of people. In practice, those bits would also be quite carefully protected, either through procedure or through, because so one thing you can do is you can um, limit people to pulling areas of code, you know, or sub projects within Git on the server so that not everybody is doing it. And some bits which are really crucial that are going to affect millions of users that, you know, they will have serious protection lines. And that's actually the best thing we should talk about next is um, the kind of process that teams go through to make sure they coordinate who's doing what. So companies like GitHub and GitLab, they have added these extra features like milestones and issues. Issues are like tickets, things that need doing. And so um, what they'll say is, okay, here's a ticket that needs, like a bug that needs fixing or a new feature we want to add. 
and we'll assign it to a person or a set of people. And those people will be responsible for writing the code that will resolve that ticket. So what they'll do in practice actually is kind of interesting. The team is most likely to then create a temporary branch, which we've talked about before, with the ID of that ticket as this kind of its name, because you otherwise you'd have millions of tickets, millions of numbers. So you name the branch after the kind of ticket you're trying to fix, the issue you're trying to fix. And then um, as a group, you'll work only on that version that's set aside. So you're not disrupting the main version of your software. You're not disrupting the main branch. You're working on like this side developer branch just for this particular issue. And then you will all kind of work on that, finish it, test it yourself probably. And then you will uh, push that code onto the server. And then you will create what's called a merge request or a pull request, depending on what, whether you're using GitHub or GitLab. <laughs> They've got a slightly different language. And what that really then says is uh, we want a senior developer to check it's all OK and then merge it if it's fine. And that's no, that job is normally reserved for someone whose job they've got the authority to check something and check it's good and also to put it, do something risky like merge it with the product you're about to release. You know, some more senior people are maybe given that job. And so you can ask GitLab or GitHub to uh, notify people that uh, like a new set of code for an issue is ready to review. And companies will have review processes that are they're required to do. Like someone will check that it meets legal standards. Someone will check that the code structure conforms to the company's standards and that sort of thing. And people will say, yes, this looks fine to me. Yes, it looks fine to me. Or no, go back and do more. And it creates a conversation, forces them to have a conversation. And then only when they're happy with it, the senior person will do the job of git merge and merge it into some sort of main, main version of the software. And what you'll find is some companies, they will have the main version, which is like their release product. And they'll have like a release candidate branch. And the people who are doing their fixes are branching from that branch. And so they make sure the side one works. And then only then at some point in the future, they say, OK, this is a release ready version that we have collectively built. And then someone really important <laughs> will carefully make that a public thing for someone to use. Um, so lots of companies will uh, protect what's the main branch or protect different versions. Um, and they won't give permissions to types of users like developers to push directly to that because that will break it. So it might break it. Might break it. Yeah. They're really worried that people will just push a version and delete, or, you know, delete something critical to the main version of the software. So all these protections and processes are put in place to help teams collaborate. But I mentioned earlier that sometimes they create like a beta version and they name the version with the Git tag like a beta release ready or release candidate. What they're doing is they're releasing the software uh, to a set of authorized users who are able to download that beta version. And then hopefully those more expert sort of known beta users will say, oh, I found something that breaks and then let you know before you release it to the whole world. <laughs> And you can actually do that with um, Chromium, which we talked about before, because on Chromium, you can download the latest beta version. You can download the latest release candidates. You can download the, the final version they ended up with yesterday. So you can choose as a developer to go and get these potentially buggy versions and help them to debug it by being part of a sort of smaller known community. And then all the people that don't know what a beta is in practice, they just download official releases that Chrome tells them to update when they're told to update. So, um, it is handy having these kind of first set of people that will try something to show that it breaks, which is normally like your own developer community, and then a slightly broader community you're happy to have the beta version of. And then when it's been tested by lots of people, then it goes out. Because, of course, there are benefits in having the beta version. It might have new features that uh, you know, nobody else has got, right? Yeah, and so like, I know a lot of computer science students are always happy to get like, the latest beta version. And for a while, I was subscribing to the latest release candidate of, of Mac OS X. And uh, that was fine until like the first release candidate for two weeks, they broke Apple Mail. <laughs> you know, and which, you know, if people were using this on test machines, that wouldn't matter because I was using it on my main work machine and suddenly I couldn't use Apple Mail for two weeks. But you know, as a person who is happy to test release candidates or beta versions, you expect that stuff maybe doesn't work entirely. You get early access to features, that's maybe exciting. And probably you're technically competent enough to not worry if something breaks or you know, delete your beta version and then download the proper version if you really need it. So what happens is uh, we... So we'd have to go over here, across the distributed shared memory link, to get the value, and then we could bring the value back. So rather than taking 100 nanoseconds, it would take... Just trying to get packets from one lab to another. Now, obviously, by 1986, we've got lots of things in Europe. 